And that's also going to be very helpful in not reacting because now some little itch comes, we're sort of you know, doing this all the time. But if we're noticing that, we can just watch it and then you'll see that it'll pass and you didn't have to move. So that's good. I, I experienced the waterfall with the thought. Now, I wonder if I'm in the river. Mm -hmm. I see the thought. It doesn't pass away quickly. It's still there, but not as long as, as the thoughts that I was carried into them. Yeah. So I don't know if I, I'm tricking myself, I'm just catching myself quicker mm -hmm. and I let them go, yeah. or whether I'm in the river. Yeah. Um, <coughs> of course, some days our mind is much more active, and other days it's, it's a little bit more quiet. Um, but that analogy, the waterfall, was just a sort of a general thing that, in general, as a beginner, there'll be a lot of things going on. And now, um, when we begin this practice, what often happens is some thought comes, and before we know it, we're off on some story, and maybe it's only minutes later we go, oh, hang on, where am I? And we come back again, another one comes up, and then off we go again on a story. We're completely lost in the story. And then if we keep watching, then pro usually the next step is that something comes, we get hooked on it, but we don't get completely lost in the story. We have a little bit of step back, there's still a story happening, but now we're sort of a bit more watching the story than completely lost in the story. There is a longer time to see them away. So, so, so I, I have the time to say goodbye. Yeah, so, so that's, that's right. So you're still a little bit in the story, but now you're, now you can sort of step back a little bit and you're not completely lost. And of course, you're still grasping a bit, which means the thoughts are going to probably stay there longer, you know? And then if you keep watching, then you'll notice uh, that the story starts to break down. And it's it, 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 instead of some story unfolding, you'll find more random things appearing and they'll be much quicker usually because you're not grabbing them. I'll try again. <laughs> um, and, and the thing is here that to not have unrealistic expectations, but the fact that you can notice that is already much better than the average person. But, but, but it's not, uh, I don't know if I should say thank you, but, but uh, it's not like the other way. It Correct. It, it doesn't pop out and disappear like a bubble. Like before, they just slightly longer to see it, yeah, and and see them go. And of it's course, the other thing, it's not it's not like being carried out carried exactly. In, in and the other thing, of course, is that if if we're improving this, you remember we talked about the threshold that's going down, which means we're going to pick up this thought much earlier than normal. Now we only sort of pick it up when it's here, so it, it's sort of a lot of, there's still a, a lot happening here, and then it, so we only notice it. But if it goes down, we'll notice it earlier, and we'll be able to watch it a bit later. So that could also happen. Yeah. I just want to ask or say, I had all the time a lot of stress here, and with my eyes, and I found a solution. Very good, very good. No, it's like I change the word that you... I hear you say look for. Look. To look for thought, like to... to um, what I thought it's to look. Oh, look. No, I, I'm, I was stressing here right. with my eyes, and then I decided to listen. Listen, good. So my uh, consciousness, my uh, awareness... Where it's not here, like, it's more out. It's not here, yes. Good. It's just on a word, and I feel my uh, spine is like a radar, antenna, like, yeah. Yeah? 
and this helps me very much. I'm Good. alert. I'm not. Uh, I'm not well, falling to darkness. Meanwhile, Good. maybe tomorrow. <laughs> so just the, the the word from sure to listen and. Yeah. make a big difference for me. Fantastic. Very good. <laughs> Very good. Yeah. Okay. Here then. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm still puzzled. Puzzled? Yes, with, with the, um, the sliding scale. The sliding scale? Yeah. yeah. Um, on one side, you said, release the thoughts. Right? On the, right, on the left side, release the thoughts with stillness. Release no, them. no, you don't release them. You're not releasing them. You're just not paying attention not to paying them. Attention. Yeah. Not paying attention. Not paying attention. side observe them yeah in the middle what is happening in, in, in the middle because you're doing both you're you're resting in stillness and paying attention to the thoughts okay. it's, it's, it's the same matter it's the same stuff like this I don't know how to explain no. my, my question. like the space and the, the thoughts that arising from the space are the same material exactly so it's like taking me in two points but this is the same material and right well that's why it isn't two points because it's the same material but there are two aspects to the material and normally we only only pay attention to one aspect and we sort of skip miss the other one so that's why I'm I was introducing that so we can you We can look at both aspects of the same material. Does that make sense? Yeah. <laughs> okay, let's go to this evening. Oh, oh sorry, question. Can, uh, can you teach us how to walk with the fall? With the, the screen? Uh, the fall? The fall? The waterfall? Oh, waterfall. Uh, to walk with the, to, how to walk with the waterfall and the stream and the river? Right uh, to the lake. Yeah. Um, these are just the stages of progress in the practice. It's not like working with the waterfall or it's just that when we do this practice, in the initial stages, what we notice is a lot of things, constantly, thoughts, motions, non-stop. That's waterfall. No, I'm to stand under the waterfall. No, you're not standing under the waterfall. <laughs> that, that's what we do now. We stand under it and get, and get caught up. The idea is to step back and watch the waterfall. We're watching the waterfall. And if we watch the waterfall, we'll notice that the waterfall turns into a fast-flowing river. And if we watch the fast-flowing river, we'll see that it becomes a slow-moving river. And if we keep watching that, it suddenly will become a still lake. Okay, let's go to this evening's topic. So, this chart is the uh, standard model that is usually presented in terms of the stages of progress in Shamatha practice. And if we go over on page two at the top, the top sentence says, Shamatha is attained by progressing through the nine stages of relying on the eight antidotes to abandon the five faults. This is accomplished through the six powers and the four mental engagements. So we see we already went through these five faults and eight antidotes. So if we ap- apply these eight antidotes to these five faults in our practice, then we will slowly move along these nine stages to Shamata. And Shamata is the diagram in the middle at the top. So let's start to have a look at the diagram. Uh, and it says here that this is accomplished through the six powers and the four mental engagements. We don't really need to worry about the four mental engagements at the moment. Um, but the six powers are the six sections of straight road. So first off, down the bottom here, the meditator, remember... We saw that in the left hand is a rope that is symbolizing the main tool of mindfulness. We are tying our mind with the rope of mindfulness to the object. And in the right hand of the meditator is a hook. That's the hook of introspection. So that's to hook the mind back when we notice we've become dull or distracted. And the, the elephant is the mind. The fact that it is black is symbolizing dullness or laxity. 
The monkey is discursive or conceptual thought in general. The fact that it is black is symbolizing this excitement, the most common form of distraction. We are uh, distracted by the so-called sense pleasures, which we saw were drawn in the middle there, the bowl of fruit, the cloth, the shell, the, the symbols and the, and the mirror. So down here, uh, this first straight road is called the road of hearing, the, uh, the power of hearing. So to get into the practice, to start the practice, we need to hear about instructions from a teacher or even includes reading a book. So we need to hear some instructions about what to do and then we can get into the practice. And that will bring us to stage one here called setting the mind. And what we notice here is that the elephant and monkey are running wildly ahead, ahead of the meditator. So what we notice at stage one of our practice is that we sit down to focus on the object, and let's say the object is the breath. We focus on the breath for maybe two or three seconds, and then oof, off we go on our stories. And then often we're caught up in some story for many minutes at a time, and then after a few minutes we go, hang on, I'm supposed to be on the breath. We come back to the breath again for another two or three seconds, and then off we go again. And so often when that happens, uh, when we start to meditate, um, we often think, I can't meditate. I just can't meditate. In fact, I think I must be doing something wrong because before my mind was sort of okay, but now since I've started meditating, it's gone crazy. So I, I must be doing something wrong. And then often in a group situation, then people open their eyes and look around and everyone's very still. I'm the only one who can't meditate. Everyone else can. I'm hopeless. So if this is your experience, you can meditate. In fact, noticing how out of control our mind really is, is the first sign of progress in practice. Because until we sit down to try to focus on a single object, we have this sort of illusion that our mind is sort of okay, you know. Focusing on the breath, well, that can't be too difficult. You know, I'll maybe get a bit distracted, but I think that shouldn't be too difficult. But of course, when we sit down and find that we're hardly on the breath at all, most of the time we're completely distracted. Um, but that's the, that is the first sign of progress, so good work. Um, that is the first sign, that is stage one, is simply noticing how chaotic and out of control our mind really is. And this little, the flame down the bottom here, on the side of the road, which you see is very big at the bottom, and as we wind up the road, it gets smaller and smaller and smaller, and then towards the top uh, three or four stages, it disappears altogether. That flame is the amount of effort we need to put in terms of our mindfulness and introspection. Now our mindfulness and introspection is not very well developed, so we have to have a lot of effort to hold the object, a lot of effort to monitor that. But as our mindfulness and introspection becomes more and more developed, you'll find in the higher stages, because now our mindfulness and introspection are well developed, they just happen spontaneously. We don't need to put a lot of conscious effort. That's why the flame disappears eventually. Um, so to talk a little bit about this stage one, um, again, I'd like to read a little bit from Alan Walsh's Attention Revolution. He talks about this on page 13. The first of the nine stages leading to the achievement of shamatha is called directed attention. That's the name he gives to it. Um, the sign of having reached this stage is simply being able to place your mind on your chosen object of meditation for even a second or two. If you are trying to direct your attention to a difficult object, such as a complex visualization, this may take days or weeks to accomplish. But if your chosen object is your breathing, you may achieve this stage with your very, on your very first attempt. The faculty of mindfulness is crucial, is crucial in shamatha practice. Mindfulness in this context differs somewhat from the way some contemporary meditation teachers present it. So we mentioned that already, that 
some modern day traditions uh, have redefined the word mindfulness to mean something a little bit different. And that's what he says now. He says, Vipassana teachers, for instance, commonly explain mindfulness as a moment-to-moment, non-judgmental awareness of whatever arises. In the context of shamatha, however, mindfulness refers to attending continuously to a familiar object without forgetfulness or distraction. The first stage of directed attention is achieved by the power of hearing. According to Buddhist tradition, the most effective way to accomplish fresh learning is directly from an experienced, knowledgeable teacher. First you hear teachings, then you follow up with reading, study and practice. The power of hearing refers both to listening to instructions and also to reading about them, especially if no qualified teacher is available. One of the first signs of progress in shamatha practice is simply noticing how chaotic our minds are. We try to remain attentive, but we, we swiftly lose our minds and slip into absent-mindedness. People who never sit quietly and try to focus their minds may remain under the illusion that their minds are calm and collected. Only when we try to direct the attention to a single object for minutes on end does it really become apparent how turbulent and fragmented our attention is. From a Buddhist perspective, the untrained mind is afflicted with attention deficits and hyperactivity. It is dysfunctional. Like a wild elephant, the analogy here, an untamed, the untamed mind can inflict enormous damage on ourselves and those around us. In addition to oscillating between attention deficit and hyperactivity, the normal untrained mind compulsively disgorges a toxic stream of wandering thoughts, then latches onto them obsessively, carried away by one story after another. Attention deficit hyperactivity disorders and obsessive compulsive disorders are not confined to those who are diagnosed as mentally ill. The normal mind is prone to such imbalances and that's why normal people experience so much mental distress. Such disturbances are symptoms of an unbalanced mind. So if we continue to practice, we will slowly move around to the second stage here called continuous setting, uh, continuous attention. And that road is called the road of contemplation or reflection. Means that to go deeper into the practice, we reflect more about the practice to get a better understanding and to become more enthusiastic about the practice. And then if we keep practicing, we go around to stage two. And at stage two here, what we notice is the elephant and monkey are not running so fast anymore. And they have a little bit of white on the tops of their head. That white is symbolizing stability and clarity. So now by stage two in the practice, we are starting to notice um, there will be periods in our meditation where our mind settles down more and we're more focused. And maybe we can hold the object for up to a minute or two before we lose the object. But even at stage two, when we get distracted, we tend to be distracted for long periods of time. So even at stage two, we tend to be more off the object than on the object. So again, let's see, um, read a little bit from Attention Revolution about stage two. So this is on page 30. He says the following. In the second of the nine stages, continuous attention, you experience occasional periods of continuity. But most of the time, your mind is still caught up in wandering thoughts and sensory distractions. Don't be misled by the name of this stage. Continuous attention doesn't mean that you can maintain unbroken continuity for long stretches, but that now and again you can remain centred on for a sustained period without completely losing track of your chosen, of your object of attention. However, time and again, you'll still lapse back into coarse excitation, 
completely forgetting about the intended object of attention. When you can occasionally maintain continuity of, a, of awareness of bodily sensations for about a minute, you have achieved the sec you have reached the second stage. The second stage is achieved by the power of thinking. The challenge in this phase of practice is to sustain interest in the object, and you can do this by thinking about the instructions between sessions. If you are a seasoned meditator, you've probably found that involuntary internal commentary on your practice can be an obstacle. Even the ongoing thought, here is the in-breath, here is the out-breath, can be an intrusion. However, internal commentary can also be useful, especially in the first two stages of shamatha practice. If you're thinking about the practice, at least you're not thinking about something else. And so that's what we did um, earlier in this retreat, is we brought in the idea of counting the breath, noting the breath, labelling thoughts and so forth. That's a little bit of internal commentary, but it really can help us to stay more focused. But as Anwal said, um, it's a short-term strategy. Whatever shamatha practice we're doing, um, as we get deeper into the practice, we'll need to do le have less and less commentary because that commentary will quickly start to become another distraction. <clears throat> that's enough. So that's stage two. Yeah. Are, are these stages re referring to any object? Like, do you have to be able to maintain continuous attention regardless of the chosen object? So, this um, model is the classic model, particularly for something like the breath. As we saw when we're using the mind as the object, you can still use this model, but more, more appropriate or more helpful is that other model, the waterfall, fast-flowing river, and so forth. And actually, on page three here, there is a sort of an attempt to correlate the nine-stage model with the four-stage model, which is in the right-hand column. So, you know, like, for example, the waterfall is sort of roughly equivalent to the first three stages and so on. Um, so, if we're using like a specific object, the breath, or maybe a mental image or something, then this would be a very good model to help us to understand where we are in the practice. And so then, if whatever the object is, you know, if we can hold it for a minute or two, then we're at stage two, roughly, yeah. Does working on, let's say, you, let's say I want to work on observing the mind, if I progress... But see, the mind is happens. that there's thoughts and emotions coming up. So then, you know, it's a, we're not attending to a, a single object in that sense. The but question we, is, is would I, if, if I progress far enough, would I then be able to have a similar skill set if I started... Oh, yes, 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 yes. Yeah, that's right. So um, if you... Yes, I mean, what, what we're going to see, like, um, at stage four, we can hold the object the entire session without ever losing it. So, yes, whatever object you use, you'll, the mindfulness and introspection will improve. So you don't have to start from square one, depending on what object you're working on. So if you, you don't have to, like, if you want to work on the breath for... Oh, you, then you go back to then square you one. To, no, 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 no. <laughs> No, in fact, Alan Wallace is one of his recommendations in his book is use the breath for the first four stages, and then switch to using the mind. But that doesn't mean we start back at square one. Otherwise, no point in doing the breath for four stages. Might as well start with the, the mind from the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. What is about the, the elephant? What is that? The mind. The elephant's the mind, the fact that it's black is symbolising dullness, oh. laxity. So now stage three, if we go around the corner, if we keep practising, we'll go around to the corner to stage three and four, and this is the road of mindfulness. So now at stage three and four, our mindfulness is getting a lot better. So much so that now we see the rope of mindfulness is really tied to the elephant of the mind. Meaning that at stage three, 
Now we can hold the object uh, for about five or ten minutes at a time. And now, if we get distracted, we quickly recognize that and quickly come back. Before that, we tended to be distracted for quite long periods of time. And that ability to quickly return from a distraction is symbolized by the elephant turning the head backwards, meaning we quickly return to the object. But now what we see is the rabbit has come into the picture on the back of the elephant, and the rabbit is symbolizing what's called subtle dullness, subtle laxity. And I think I briefly mentioned this earlier, a, a day or two ago, um, because here from stage three, this rabbit starts to become a bit of an issue. Because at stage three, and let's say we're using the breath, we can focus on the breath five or ten minutes. If we get distracted from the breath, we quickly come back. So then we could think, wow, I've really gone a long way. I'm, I'm pretty well on the breath the whole time, and if I get distracted, I'm really back very fast. So we could think, well, actually, I think I'm pretty close to shamatha. <laughs> so even though our mindfulness is getting a lot better the quality of our attention still needs a lot of work. And so here at stage three, we need to start now to pick up the fact that our mind is sinking, that it's getting a little bit dull. Because if we don't pick that up, we'll get stuck here. We won't be able to progress. So that's why the rabbit has come into the picture. Of course, the rabbit existed at stage one and two, but we had much more heavy problems at stage one and two than a little bit of subtle dullness. But from stage three, we now need to really start to, to pick that up. Otherwise, we'll get stuck. Um, and just briefly talk a little bit about stage three again in attention revolution. Some, uh, I think some useful advice here on page 43. He says the following. When you reach the third stage, he calls it resurgent attention. What is resurgent? Resurgent means um, resurgent. To resurge means to, to, come back, to come back again. Again. So it means like if we get distracted, we come back very quickly. During each practice session, your attention is fixed most of the time on your meditative object. By now, you will have increased the duration of each session beyond the initial 24 minutes to perhaps twice that. So here in his book, he talks about, as a beginner, to meditate 24 minutes. Why 24? Why not 25 or 20? The reason is because in ancient India, uh, when they measured time, they didn't, use, they didn't have the system of measurement of hours, minutes and seconds. In fact, they, they divided the day, not into 24 like we do, but they divided each day into 60 units. And, a, and one unit was called a gatika. So one sixtieth of a day is 24 minutes, of course. And so in the meditation text, it, 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 some, it often says, as a beginner, it's good to meditate about one gatika. So that's 24 minutes. So that's why 24 minutes. And so what he's saying here is that by stage three, we're probably meditating twice that. So remember, quality over quantity. But if we want to go deeper into the practice, particularly when we're getting after, sort of from stage two onwards, we we'll probably want to be extending how long we meditate. So he's suggesting here by stage three, we're probably meditating you know, at least 45 minutes in a session. Whereas maybe stage one, 15 or 20, stage two, maybe a little bit more. But by stage three, we're probably up to about 45 minutes in a session because we can sustain that. Um, as your attention gradually stabilizes, you may increase the duration of each session by increments of three minutes. So he's suggesting, you know, increment three minutes. Don't like double it from one day to the next. At all times though, Value the quality of your meditation over the quantity of time spent in each session. If you sit for long periods, but let your mind rove around unnoticed among distractions or fall into dullness, 
Not only are you wasting your time, but you're also developing bad habits that will only get harder